1045, the team, you're home for New York sports. We are joined by Barry Abrams right now, ESPN's horse racing insider. Barry, what did you make of the performance from Always Dreaming? Well, it was aided by a couple of things, and I don't want to take anything away from Always Dreaming. He's a good horse. He was post-time favorite. He should have won. There were a couple of things that helped him here. Number one was the weather. The uh, track was sealed down on the inside, which is not what typically happens. Typically, when it rains, you know, crown is the, the, the uh, track is crowned. It's higher in the middle, so the water runs down on both sides. And so, normally, the footing down near the rail is not very good. You usually want to be out in the middle, but. This was a big couple of days, Oaks and Derby Day, and so what Churchill Downs did was they took this heavy rectangular big piece of wood that was had that was weighted down and had weights on it, and they ran it all the way around the track and basically squeegeed out the water down along the rail. I see. Yeah, there was so a guy riding it like Spartacus. <laughs> <laughs> and so the uh, the track was rock hard down on the inside and. Not only did horses down on the rail win, but horses that went to the front early won on both days pretty consistently. And so Always Dreaming was never wider than the two-path all the way around. He was known to have early speed, you know, go to the front early. And he held on. Looking at Lee, the long shot who finished second, did the same thing. He basically went to the rail at the very beginning of the race because he had the rail spot. And... The seas parted for him, and he just maintained that position basically, I would say, the last three quarters of a mile. So that's not to say that Always Dreaming wouldn't have won this race on a dry track. He won the Florida Derby on a dry track, but that certainly helped him. The other thing that helped him was the demolition derby going on behind him. Mm -hmm. I mean, traffic is always a problem when you have 20 horses, but the last couple of years you really didn't have a lot of horses that you can say, well, he got bumped and he got slammed and that's what did him in. But that sure was the case on Saturday. As soon as the gate opened, Classic Empire, who was the morning line favorite, who went from that last stall in the main gate where you really should have some more room because there's the apparatus that connects the second gate. Well, the horse that was first in the second gate, McCracken, who I thought was going to win the race, the both of them broke, saw daylight, and ran right to it and collided with each other, just slammed each other. Uh, Gervin, who I thought had a live shot at 22 to 1, had to really check hard going around the far turn, and that took him out of it. And there are others as well who suffered traffic trouble. So I think Always Dreaming ran a good race, and I'm really not trying to take anything away from him, but he was helped a little bit by what happened down along the rail with the uh, track condition and the demolition derby that happened behind it. You touched on liking both Gervin and McCracken in the race. Why didn't you like Always Dreaming? What was your concern about him leading up to the race? It's not that I didn't like him. I certainly wouldn't bet him at four and a half to one, nine to two. But he had only run in one stakes race, and I just didn't think he had enough seasoning. Todd Pletcher, his trainer... He's known for winning a lot of the prep races leading up to the Derby, but the conventional wisdom is that those races take a little bit too much out and the horses peak a little too early, and that's one reason, though not the only, that he had such a poor record in the Derby. So I just thought maybe always dreaming had peaked, the physical conditioning and the seasoning just weren't there, but he ran a great race and he's the Derby winner. 104.5, the team, your home for New York sports. Barry Abrams with us right now. So, Barry, always dreaming, you know, wins, has the perfect run. As I look at that horse, I really liked it. Like, you know, I'm I'm kind of a homer, so I like the name and all that fun stuff, and I I like Johnny V. Is there any reason for me to believe that it could do it again in the Preakness? Well, sure. I mean, typically, no matter how good or bad you think the Derby winner is, the form usually holds up well in the Preakness. Even my mad bird, who was 50 to 1 when he won the Derby in 2009, had not really won anything before and didn't win anything after, still finished a very close second in the Preakness to the great Rachel Alexandra, and there's no harm in ever finishing second to her. 
So the form translates usually from the Derby to the Preakness. So I have no reason to believe that Always Dreaming won't run a good race. Will he win it? Well, there's going to be some challengers here. Looking at Lee is considering going to the Preakness. We don't know yet. Classic Empire is considering going to the Preakness. He had a little eye issue coming out of the Derby. I don't know whether something got in his eye or whatever. And so trainer Mark Cassie is waiting to see whether or not that heals up quickly. If it goes away in a day, which it might, then he is considering sending Classic Empire onto the Preakness. And there are some new challengers coming in. I think that also will present a little bit of a an issue for him, including Conquest Mo Money, who finished second in the Sunland Derby and second to Classic Empire in the Arkansas Derby. He's been pretty much put on the shelf and said, we're not going to run him in the Derby, we're going to run him in the Preakness. Uh, the first horse that would have made it into the Derby had there been a scratch, Royal Mo, is also going to run the Preakness with Gary Stevens, who knows a thing or two about upsetting people in the Preakness when he won with Oxbow back in 2012. So there'll be some challengers. Obviously, the best horses ran in the Derby, but you know you have the classic conundrum of lesser competition potentially, but a Derby winner who's a little bit tired. I think. You know, always dreaming will be there. Whether he actually wins, you know, we'll see. For horse racing fans who may not have had a chance to listen to it yet, what can they expect from your podcast in the gate? We do a show that is designed to appeal to the people who would listen to this show. It's a little bit more casual. It's not for the person betting the fifth at Indiana Downs on Thursday night. Hmm. And so we try to talk to a more general audience. You know, we entertain where we can. We get serious when we have to. We have fun when we when it's appropriate. And if you subscribe to us, you might learn something. And even crazier, you might just like it. <laughs> <laughs> Barry Abrams, uh, man, we got uh, Saratoga. I, I'm not going to, I'm not counting, but 74 days away till the meet starts. Uh, any chance you'll be up here for the uh, Saratoga races? I'll absolutely be there for the Whitney. Uh, I'm not sure beyond. I'll, I'll probably also come back to the new Equestricon event that's happening up there in uh, Saratoga. I think it's August 13th through the 15th. It's basically like Comic-Con for horses. It's the first time it's ever been done, and I know I'm definitely going up there for some of that, so hopefully we'll run into each other. Well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's take hopefully out of it. We'll plan something, Barry. We love it, yeah. You know where to find me. <laughs> Barry Abrams, <laughs> man, we appreciate you. Thanks, guys. Anytime.